Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure update. It's the 18th of July. Decent number of updates this week, spread over quite a lot of different areas. So as always, you can just jump to the update you care about the most. New videos this week. I dived into a pretty huge update related to Entra for Microsoft Security Copilot. So now I can use natural language to interact against a huge range of different Entra areas. And there's a new agent for conditional access that will help proactively let you know if you have gaps because of new users, new applications that are falling between the seams of your existing policies and resolving that. And also, hey, if I have policies doing the same thing, it can help guide on merging them together. And then I did an absolute beginner's guide for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Obviously, AI is everywhere today but it's good to understand some of the foundational pieces because obviously all of these agents, Agentic, Assistants, GPTs, whatever, they all still build on these core principles. So it's good to have an understanding of those. So on to what's new on the compute side. So PowerShell Durable Functions uh, SDK is GA. Remember, Durable Functions give us that ability to have longer running serverless components. They can fan out and fan back in. I can get manual interactions. Well, now we have a standalone PowerShell module, and I can use that to author these Durable Function apps so I don't have to, hey, struggle as we, we kind of did before. Durable Functions also now has versioning orchestration. So obviously, as I create these orchestrated, durable, long-running function apps, well, I'll, I'll make changes to those. So what I can do is I can now assign a version to those different versions of the orchestration. And so I know, well, what specific functionality of orchestration am I using? And I can even have the workers align with a certain version. So this can actually help me roll out changes in a very controlled way. This is available for the .NET isolated durable function mode. And that does include the durable task scheduler. I can now trigger Azure Functions because again, they're serverless. There's some event that triggers the Azure function to run. So I can now trigger it using Kafka topics. So I have these real-time messages showing as part of the Azure Functions consumption plan. And then I can go and trigger this Azure function. If I want to actually write to a Kafka topic, I can now do that via the output binding of my Azure function. AKS node auto provisioning has gone GA. So one of the challenges we've had in the past is when I have unscheduled pods, i.e. pods that need to come to life because of changes in scale of a workload, but they've not been allocated to a particular node yet. Maybe there's not enough capacity on the existing nodes. They don't fit. So normally what would happen is you would auto scale the node pool and that node pool would be of a specific VM SKU and size. Well, it's possible just doing that scaling would be non-optimal. It would create too much extra space. So I'm paying for a bigger VM than I actually need. So what this node auto provisioning does is it will provision single instance nodes based on the most optimal VM size, based on those pods, those unscheduled pods that are waiting to be assigned to a node. So that means it's gonna pick the size that's required based on what it actually needs to schedule, i.e. place on a node, as opposed to just this bulk standard size that may be too big. And this is all actually built on the open source Carpenter project. AKS VM node pools have also gone GA. So what normally happens with an AKS node pool is it's based on a virtual machine scale set. So the virtual machine scale set has a certain template, which is based on a certain VM SKU size, and it auto scales that using VM scale set functionality. VM node pools are not based on VM scale set. Instead, the VMs in the node pool are individually provisioned, bootstrapped, managed by AKS. So what that lets me do is I'm no longer constrained to one VM SKU and size within the node pool. It lets us have multiple VM SKU sizes within the same VM family within that node pool. So that again helps us optimize the size based on what we actually need to do. 
an AKS availability set migration now has a command to help us migrate. This is in preview. Availability sets, remember, used to be aligned with racks. So fault domain zero, one, two were three racks, but in the same cluster. So my blast radius was, hey, I could survive a node failure, a rack failure, a top of, sack, top of rack switch failure, but not a data center level failure. We prefer availability zones. Availability zones are separate groups of data centers that have their own isolated power network calling. So we have a much greater resiliency to events. Well, we want to migrate away from that. We have things like standard load balance and standard public IPs that also align with zone redundancy. So now if I am using those availability sets, if I am using basic load balances, if I am using basic public IPs that are all being deprecated end of September, well, instead of now having to take an outage and maybe change IPs, everything else, with a single command, I can now migrate to the newer model. I can migrate to a standard public IP, to a standard load balancer. There's a few prerequisites to install. And then I just run AZ AKS update with a new migrate VM AS to VM switch. And it's all done for me. AKS max blocked nodes allowed is also in preview. It just lets me specify how many nodes can fail to drain, i.e. it's blocking during an upgrade or some similar type of operation. And then AKS extension manager has moved to the control plane in GA. So the extension manager is what manages the life cycle of AKS cluster extensions. Think Flux, Azure Backup, Cilium, Dapper, there's other ones as well. But they used to be part of cluster worker nodes. Well, now they're just moving to the AKS control plane. So what that really means for me is it's going to simplify my security, my networking, it reduces my operational overhead as they're not running as part of my node pool workers anymore. It shifted off into that control plane. The networking side. So Hobo means something different in many countries, but Hobo public IP for express route gateways has gone GA. So Hobo is hosted on behalf of. Now, when I use an express route gateway, which member gives me connectivity via my express route circuit from likely on-premises to my virtual network via pri private peering, well, the gateway still requires a public IP address. And that's used for various control plane operations. It's not used as part of the data path, but the customer had to manage that public IP. We've hosted on behalf of, I don't. It's now hosted by Microsoft. It's not exposed to you. It allows Microsoft to automatically apply policies like data rate limiting, enhanced auditing, and hey, you can now go and leverage that. Azure Front Door Classic and Azure CDN Classic SKUs are retiring, middle of August, any new domain onboarding or profiles. So what this means is you need to migrate to Azure Front Door Standard or Premium SKUs for any new domains or profiles you have. But also as part of this, one of the things we require is to validate we own a domain. And there's a method called CNAME Based Domain Control Validation, which just means that I would create a CNAME record in the DNS zone to prove I have control of it. That's really being deprecated. DigiCert is deprecating uh, that method. So those same SKUs also are going to need to stop using that method. If you're trying to move to a managed certificate, we need to move away from that. You're not going to be able to renew. So again, you could bring your own certificate or move to standard premium SKUs. Storage side. So AZ NFS 3.0. Uh, i.e. Blob NFS has had a major update. So what this lets me do is use NFS to talk to Azure Blob Storage. Now it's enabled via this Blob NFS solution and it has an AZ NFS mount helper running on the Linux boxes. So now I can go and consume my Blob Storage using the NFS protocol to the NFS endpoint. Now separate from that is Blob Fuse. And what BlobFuse lets me do is mount block blobs as if it was a virtual file system on my nodes. 
what's happening with this update, this 3.0 version, is this is now going to use the same libfuse3 library as blobfuse. Well, that brings a significant number of changes. There's a significant performance boost. So it's higher throughput. I think it's five times the speed of reads, three times the speed of writes. I can now have larger files support up to five terabytes. It removes this 16 group of a user limit. There's better metadata performance. So it's just, hey, you're gonna to wanna to go and use this newer version. You're gonna get much better performance. Azure Event Hub uh, Geo Replication has gone GA. This is for premium and dedicated. And basically this helps me protect against regional level outages. All of the metadata, the data within a namespace is now continually replicated from the primary region to one or more secondaries. And if I promote a secondary to primary, it will automatically switch the current primary to secondary and reverse that flow. This is an interesting one. So SSD storage for ephemeral OS disks is now GA. Ephemeral OS disks, remember, remember, let me use local storage of the node running my VM for the OS disk storage. This is useful for stateless workloads, things that I don't actually care about the uniqueness of the virtual machine. This could be part of an AKS node cluster, it could be a VDI box, anything where it's not special, and I could just recreate it if there was actually a problem. Well, the way these ephemeral OS disks actually work is it's, it's two disks there's actually a storage of the base image just put on standard hard disk drive storage that's actually free. And then it creates a differential, think of it like a child disk on the node itself that has the new writes written to it and is used for the reads of the newly written data. So think, hey, the parent disk sits on this free standard hard disk drive storage because it's so cheap and then there's actually on the local node, the writes, and then the new reads. And obviously both of those have to be there to function. But what I can now do is for that base disk that was previously only on standard hard disk drive storage, I can opt to store it on standard SSD or premium SSD. Now there's then a cost associated with that, but if I need higher performance, if I need a higher SLA, that would be an attractive option. I can do it by the portal, CLI, PowerShell, templates. So just know it's out there and I can leverage it if required. On the database side, so Cosmos DB is now available in Microsoft Fabric in preview. Remember Microsoft Fabric is sitting on top and builds off this idea of a Delta Parquet open format that powers its one lake. So I've got this one format for all the data in the one lake, then all the different engines, the capabilities, the solutions in Fabric all use that one format. So that means I no longer have to think about extracting, transforming, loading data, duplicating data over many systems because I need different types of insights. I want to use different engines. So it makes it much easier to use. I get insights much faster because it's using this one storage. Now we already have the ability to have relational data from SQL databases. We have SQL database in Fabric. Well now I can do the same for Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB in Fabric will automatically mirror the data into one lake, basically in near real time. So then in near real time, I can go and use all of the other aspects of Fabric to get insights from the data. So I just create a Cosmos DB artifact in Fabric, and then it will just start mirroring to your one lake automatically. And then Azure Databricks Unity Catalog to Microsoft One Lake in Fabric capability has gone GA. So what this does is it lets Fabric access your Azure Databricks tables as a read-only data source. And then that data in Fabric is essentially automatically kept in sync. So even as I add new tables, if I remove tables, my view in Fabric will remain up to date. PostgreSQL Flexible is now available in Indonesia Central. Remember, Flexible is the VM-based option. It gives you better control. I have more tuning I can do. I have better high availability options. I have more VM SKU options. Um, there's different optimizations. So now I can use that in a new region. Miscellaneous. So Azure Backup now supports moving from standard to enhanced policies uh, in GA. Enhanced policies give me things like multiple backups per day. I get a longer retention of snapshots. I can do multi-disk crash consistency. I can do zonal resilience. 
Well, now I can just migrate to the enhanced policy from standard without disrupting any of my existing backups. And standard policies now support protecting trusted launch-enabled VMs. So those Gen 2 secure boot virtual TPM VMs, well, I can protect them now um, just using a standard policy. And Azure Backup, GRS and CRR is now available for premium SSD V2 using virtual machines in a number of new regions. So GRS, remember, replicates the storage in the vault from one place to another. Cross-region restore means I can actually restore and start that VM in the other region. So now those functionalities are available in additional regions. Norway West, Norway East, Japan West, Japan East can all now take advantage of this. And the Azure AI speaker recognition is retiring uh, end of September 2025. You just need to go and find another solution in the market. And Azure Cloud HSM has gone GA. So this is this highest level FIPS 140-3 level 3 single tenant hardware security module service. So it means it meets the most stringent security compliance needs. Now, as a customer, I get full administrative control of my own HSM cluster, which is made up of three HSM partitions. All of the keys, the policies are automatically synchronized. This is the replacement for the previous Azure dedicated HSM offering. So anywhere I have the most sensitive applications and workloads that need this level of security domain cryptographic based isolation security, this is what you're going to use. So if I need PKCS 11, if I'm migrating from Azure dedicated HSM, if I'm migrating from AWS cloud HSM, this would be the solution that's going to meet those needs. And that was it. As always, I hope that was useful. Till next video, take care.